I guess my fascination with innovation and disruption started way, way back when I first started the works of Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter. It was from him that I learned to distinguish invention, the generation of ideas or concepts for products or processes, from innovation, the translation of these new ideas into marketable products or processes, and indeed from diffusion, the widespread adoption of these products or processes in the market. Above all, I was, I was truly captivated by his concept of creative destruction, which describes the process of industrial transformation through radical innovation. What it essentially means is that the introduction of revolutionary products and services by successful entrepreneurs is the fundamental driving force for sustained long-term economic growth, but at the same time destroys the power of established institutions and organizations in the short term. When it comes to the life cycle of an innovation, all you will ever really need to know has been expertly summarized by MIT's Jim Mutterbeck in his 1998 book, Mastering the Dynamics of Innovation. He correctly describes that the rate of product innovation in a product class, or indeed in an industry, is usually highest during its initial, its formative phase. During this fluid phase, as he calls it, a great deal of experimentation with product design and operational characteristics takes place amongst competitors, and much less attention is given to the processes by which products are made. As a consequence, the rate of process innovation is significantly less rapid at this stage. It um, can also be observed that during this formative period of a new product, the processes used to produce it are usually crude, inefficient and based on a mixture of skilled labor and general purpose machinery and, and tools. At first, an innovation may be almost entirely a combination of design elements tried out in earlier uses or, or prototypes. It can also be observed that even disruptive innovations, and more about that later, um, also typically originating from outside of the incumbent industry, usually arise in the context of and resembling the technology, products or processes they will ultimately replace. And hence, at first are not or only with difficulty distinguishable. For example, the uh, first cars look very much like horse carriages, which they would shortly replace. According to Utterback, it's, it's fairly common in, in new industries of, in particular, assembled products that a pioneering firm gets the ball rolling with its initial product. Uh, a growing market begins to take shape around it and, and new competitors are inspired to enter and, and either grow the market further or, or take a chunk of it with their, their own product versions. No firm at this stage has a lock on the market and no one's product is, is really perfected. No single firm has yet mastered the process of, of manufacturing or, or achieved unassailable control of the distribution channels. At this stage of the product's evolution, both producers and customers are experimenting. Within this rich mixture of experimentation and, and competition during the, the fluid phase, and as the market grows, greater emphasis will, will usually be placed on the development of components tailored especially for the product itself. Ultimately, these may be synthesized into a model that includes most features and, and meets most user requirements. And some center of gravity eventually forms in the shape of a dominant design. Yet another term coined by Utterback together with Abernathy. A dominant design has the effect of enforcing or encouraging standardization so that production or other complementary economies can be sold. Also, once the dominant design emerges, the basis of competition changes radically as the industry enters a transitional phase in which the major product innovation slows down 
and the rate of major process innovation speeds up. A dominant design radically reduces the number of performance requirements to be met by a product by making many of those requirements implicit in the design itself. Hence, as the form of the product rapidly becomes settled, the pace of innovation in the way it's produced quickens. Competition begins to take place on the basis of cost and scale, as well as of product performance. A firm in possession of collateral assets, such as market channels, brand image and customer switching cost, will have some advantage over its competitors in terms of enforcing its product as the dominant design. In the uh, ensuing new era of competition, the linkage of product technologies with manufacturing process, corporate organization and strategy, and the structure and dynamics of an industry is essential. Interestingly, also at least with respect to consumer products, narrowing the outward appearance between a new technology and those of the old and familiar can help in creating market success. Before long, the competitive landscape changes. And from one characterized by, by many firms and, and many unique designs, to one of upwards consolidation with only few firms with similar product designs surviving. At this point, product variety begins to give way to standard designs that have either proven themselves in the marketplace as the best form for satisfy, satisfying user needs uh, or designs that have been dictated by accepted standards by legal or regulatory constraints. By the way, in the financial world, the dominant design is chiefly created by regulation. One good example for this is the Swiss investment funds market. Also, Switzerland is one of the most important markets for the distribution of funds. It has not managed to become a significant domicile for retail or alternative funds. The main reason for this is that Swiss funds, also more or less identical to their EU uh, peers, do not comply with the USITS or AFMD directives, which have swiftly become the regulatory dominant designs and hence cannot be easily brought to the harmonized European market. Some industries then enter a specific phase in which the rate of major innovation dwindles for both product and process. These industries become extremely focused on cost, volume and capacity. Product and process innovation only appear in small incremental steps. And by the way, the, the model also applies in, in case of non-assembled products, but in slightly altered form. When compared to process improvements in the production of complex assembled products, process innovation in non-assembled products has a more profound impact on productivity and cost. Also process innovation in this category is more likely to emerge from within the industry. Each new wave of innovation has its fluid, transitional, and specific phase. And typically the number of firms participating in lower waves is lower, and later waves is lower. The reason for this drop-off in the number of competing firms in, in later waves is no doubt related to the fact that, that markets are often well-defined by the first wave of innovation and established firms develop the distribution channels and production facilities to serve these markets limiting the number of possible firms that can reform the industry, even with superior technology. Well, unless the new wave of innovation substantially broadens or alters the markets, or is disruptive. But more about evolution versus disruption in our next chapter. <laughs>